Hey there, uh, welcome back from the uh, afternoon tea break. Uh, my name is Saul Kaganoff. And hey there, uh, welcome back from the uh, keep, afternoon tea break. Oh, I keep doing that, leaving hop in on my other screen. Welcome back from the afternoon tea break. I'm Saul Kaganoff, I'm your MC for this afternoon. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome our next two presenters. So Liz Douglas and Andy Tam. Uh, Liz uh, is a partner at Deloitte and Andy is a director at Deloitte. They both work in the modern engineering uh, uh, um, service offering at Deloitte. And they're here to talk to us about why some organisations are slower than their competitors. So uh, welcome, uh, Liz and Andy. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Saul. And uh, and thank you, everybody, for making the time this afternoon. We do appreciate you coming along. Um, so I'm Liz Douglas, and uh, and actually I started my career as an aerospace engineer and, uh, and made my way into technology not long after that and uh, really enjoy being in the technology profession. I joined Deloitte about 18 months ago and came from working in corporates for a long period of time and joined Deloitte specifically to start the Modern Systems Engineering offering, which you're going to hear about today. And look, the basis of that is a really a belief that organisations can realise much greater levels of efficiency and velocity and effectiveness than we see in organisations commonplace today. I am based in Melbourne, which means I'm in lockdown. And I know that many of you watching today will also be in a similar circumstance. And my top tip for coping in lockdown, especially when you get stuck in the same room for a large part of the day, is to get a Swiss ball. It really did change my back health. Hi, I'm Andy Tam. Uh, I started my career as a financial analyst uh, in finance and economics. I did about 10 years of that before I got into technology. Uh, and a large transition of that tech change was in the finance and economics world. There's not that much change, really. Um, but in technology, it's pretty much nonstop. Uh, and in the last 15 to 20 years, I've been in technology working in uh, many different areas. I'm a recent joiner to Deloitte, um, again, similar to uh, to Liz, passionate about making changes in our engineering and practices in our in organizations. But prior to Deloitte, I've been working on building, maintaining, and enhancing the organizational tooling pains that you know help help get code to production, getting code to actually not even just production to customers. And that's been my primary focus in the last eight years. I think I've also done a lot of organizational transformations and whatnot. And I think that everyone is on a journey and, and I really believe that. And it's not so much as getting everyone to my journey, but we get but to their own journey. And if I get the opportunity to share in that journey for some period of time, how can I make it a little bit better? I'm based in Melbourne as well um, and in lockdown. And my, my tip was actually a lot of 3D printing. When I felt I couldn't get something fixed, I printed it out myself. And that was really kind of empowering to say, I can fix things myself without having to go to Bunnings and whatnot. Anyway, uh, so why do we need to change? Again, because of my background of economics, I look at things from a, in a, perhaps a different lens. And when, I, when I've been in Australia for the last 15 years or so, I've seen that it's, become, it was, it's largely started as a resource economy. <clears throat> uh, in a resource economy, we've been digging iron out of the ground, uh, selling it overseas at $130 a ton, and then buying it back in the shape of a car at about $100,000 a ton. And a macroeconomic view, you can't really do that forever. Most economies that then move over to a manufacturing economy uh, where we take the raw, raw material and make something good with it and then sell it off. But manufacturing in Australia hasn't quite landed. Um, the automobile industry, from a manufacturing perspective, has largely shut down. But the next economy is the knowledge economy. And arguably, in a knowledge economy, the resources are unlimited. It's our minds, it's our brains, it's our ability to come up with ideas and get them to our customers. And you'll see that still in the automotive industry, we still have the kind of the research and development for, um, is still happening in Australia. I think that's where we're trying to unlock. The, the practices that we have for um, resource and manufacturing economies are, while good and we can learn from them, don't work as effectively in a knowledge economy. 
And it kind of comes to this quote that I came across in back in 2014 by Andrew Schaefer. Um, if software is truly eating the world, why are companies still treating the people building software like they're digging ditches? <clears throat> and what do we need to change? And how do we go about taking advantage of, uh, of unlocking that talent that is inherent in everyone? But what is it that we're seeing? Yeah, um, the bottom six graphs are plots of release dates relative to, uh, sorry, iOS apps and so various iOS apps across financial industry, or financial services companies, um, and their frequency of releases. How often was their last release? And those things that are green show are uh, are less than 14 days between releases. And you can argue that the first two um, have shown good engineering and are able to adapt and make changes to their releases. The third one is getting is scattered and getting perhaps getting better. Fourth one is scattered, perhaps not getting the value that they can out of their IT spend. Fifth one is seems like they've had a concerted effort to get into better release cycles for their iOS app and potentially have gotten have done executed better engineering. And then the sixth one also seems to be slowly moving in a progression to get better. But there's also something in there that's um, that is also uh, many of you might be familiar with the state of DevOps reports and the 2014 state of DevOps report for the first time highlighted that firms with high high performing IT organizations were twice as likely sorry were twice as likely to exceed their profitability market share and productivity goals. And it took me a while to realize that it's exceed. It's not to meet their profitability goals, it's to exceed. So whatever they expected to do, they exceeded it. And that's a fairly powerful impact if you have a high performing IT organization. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Liz now to talk about how we see the how we see to help organizations achieve that outcome. Super, thanks, Andy. So uh, Andy talked about the benefits to the whole organization of having a high performance IT function. And so the question is, how do you get there? How do you actually start to go faster? And of course, the reality is that this is not something that can be done instantaneously. It, it is, to Andy's point earlier, it's going to be a journey. And today, what we wanted to talk to you about was a couple of common paths that we see organizations take when they want to improve their IT function performance. And they are an engineering-based approach and an agile lean approach. And what I'll do is I'll spend a few moments talking to you about the challenges and the limitations and what's really involved in each of those approaches that we see. I'll also talk about what's common between them and then add on something that we think is just emerging because it has been so far missing. So the first approach that we uh, wanted to talk to you about is the engineering journey. And this is most commonly favored as a journey by organizations who have really strong technical leaders as well as really capable engineers. And what's interesting about this journey is it starts really from a grassroots and is largely centered on automation. And automation is great. I mean, there's lots of opportunities to automate a large part of their, both the delivery process as well as the operations process, and to remove repetitive or error-prone work. And that includes using things like pipelines as code or infrastructure as code, as well as now more, more commonly pipelines and policy for security. So the objective of this approach is not only to build capability but also to deliver software more quickly and more reliably. And to do this by building quality into the system so that it maintains adaptability and is sustained on an ongoing basis. But is it enough? Is it enough just to do automation? Well, it's a good start. And the quote on the right, I think, sums it up well. The quote is from Nigel Kirsten, who recently published a blog when he launched the 2021 State of DevOps report. And the quote says, being good at automation does not make you good at DevOps. However, highly evolved form firms are far more likely to have implemented extensive and pervasive automation. Now, in our experience, teams that approach their 
performance acceleration from this direction likely run into two challenges. The first one is that they lack architecture direction. And so you can end up with a monolith essentially, which is very, very well built, um, but doesn't necessarily have very good architectural rigor. And I'll come back to this later. The other challenge is that they likely have lots of small teams or squads who are developing really well, doing lots of automated practices, but who don't necessarily have the governance and the processes around managing the dependencies between the teams. So while the automation focus journey is definitely valid and will speed up teams, just focusing on the engineering practices, we posit is not enough. Let's go to the next one. The other approach, uplifting IT performance that we commonly see is the agile lean approach. And this is usually favored by organizations that have a strong project or, um, or you know, more traditional, I guess, approach the way that they deliver technology, as well as often less technical leadership. Let's go to the next slide, thanks. Now, the objective, ultimately, of what organisations that go on this path are trying to achieve is exactly the same. They're trying to both build capability as well as deliver software much more quickly and reliably. But this time, the emphasis is different. In fact, it's often focused on flow. And done well, what teams that approach their work using this, this journey do is be able to bring the right work to the team at the right time. And this is achieved using a combination of visibility, making the work a lot more visible and eliminating bottlenecks in the process as a result. And it also often involves reorganizing teams into long-lived cross-functional teams that stay together. And in fact, the quote on the right-hand side talks about this. It talks about teams that are kept intact so that they can keep on iterating and improving together. Now, in our experience, organizations that approach their performance uplift journey from this direction are likely to run into two different challenges. The first one is they, they can adopt some practices which are strictly non-technical. And that means that you sometimes find teams where they're doing the ceremonies, they're doing the stand-ups, they're doing the retrospectives. But when developers go back to their desks and sit down, they're still working in the same way that they always have been. They are still not writing any automated unit tests. They're still not automating anything, in fact. The second challenge is that it can be hard to stay the course on an agile transformation because of the cost. And this is because when we introduce a lot of roles like coaches, for example, the, the operational cost of the team can go up quite substantially. And so for leaders to stay that journey for multiple years and progress the team to a really mature state, often that can be challenging. So again, whilst we see that Agile or Lean is a great starting point to uplifting IT performance, just focusing on those practices is not enough to reach full potential. So we've spoken about the two most common directions that we see organizations approaching their uplift journey. Now let's talk about what's common between them, and that is process. And to a large extent, when organizations go on the journey to work faster and to uplift their function, at a very practical level, what they end up doing is changing a whole lot of processes used to get the work done. Now, often our clients will talk to us about wanting to overcome what they call cultural resistance. That is resistance perceived from individuals who've been working in the same way for a very long time and may be hesitant to change those ways or don't see that it's possible to change those ways. And whilst there's a whole topic that we could talk about around cultural resistance, there's just one point that I wanted to make today and if we go to the next slide, please, Andy. That is that this quote, 
which is actually quoted in the book Accelerate, but is is not from not from the authors themselves. It's from uh, Shook, which is that changing process is an effective way to change culture. And the quote I really I really enjoy. What my experience taught me that was so powerful was that the way to change culture is not to first change how people think, but instead start by changing how people behave, what they do. So changing process is a great way to change behavior and ultimately culture. And again, changing process is a good thing to do. It's not the only way to change culture and you definitely need to do more than just that, but it's a good start. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So now I wanted to talk to you about what we think is the missing element from the approaches that we see organizations commonly taking to uplift their IT performance. And that is architecture. And specifically, architecture not being considered as a first class citizen throughout the entire life cycle of the system. So let's go to the next slide, thank you. And the quote on the right hand side of this slide really sums it up. When architectural complexity proliferates, systems are no longer understandable. Teams can't communicate about them, learning curves grow, morale plummets and staff turnover increases. And I'm sure that many of you would have seen that historically architecture has been something that you just do at the start of a project and then suddenly you can't find an architect anywhere. And in many organizations, unfortunately, as they get as they get older, they get changed more and more often. And the quality or the integrity of the design starts to actually erode. And this is when complexity really does start to proliferate. Now, what we do still see a lot of is what I would call the big rewrite, which is where you get to the point where you say, this system is so far gone, we are just gonna have to rewrite it. And that happens really for two reasons. One, because it's the opportunity for a fresh start. But secondly, it's a really, it's a really routine way for architects to architect, right? They come in at the start of a new, a new system. Now, pleasingly, and we are really encouraged about this, we see more and more organizations opting to take an evolutionary approach to their architecture and to modernize the systems that they have in place and indeed to maintain them in a really sustainable way by taking that approach of considering architecture as a first class citizen. And in part, we think this is for two reasons. One is because we now have better techniques for making this possible. And we are starting to see uh, domain-driven design in particular come into its fore and for organizations to be doing things like creating APIs to more loosely couple their architecture. And the second thing is that cloud technologies are obviously much more prevalent and provide on-demand access, not only for experimentation, but also for managing transitionary states in architecture as well. Let's go to the next slide, thanks. Okay, now all this reminded us when we were thinking about this talk of this parable of the blind man and an elephant. And some of you no doubt are familiar with this parable, but for those of you who aren't, let me just describe it briefly. The parable goes, and there's a few different versions of it, that a group of blind men hear that there's a strange animal called an elephant. And in order to try and understand the elephant, they all start to, to feel different parts of the elephant. And so individually they say they talk about what they can they can experience. They talk about how the trunk is as thick as a snake and the ear is like a fan and the leg is like a tree trunk and uh, the, the tail is like a rope and the tusk is like a spear. And of course, the main message of the parable is that they're all right. Everybody who's touching the elephant is experiencing something which is true about the elephant. But 
their experience is inherently limited by their failure to take into account the totality of what they see. And hence, this is why we actually would advocate for a multidisciplinary approach to uplifting IT performance. Andy. To that, thank you, Liz. And to talk, talk about that, we think about it in, with, uh, about process, architecture, culture, and engineering. It helps us give, remind us of the multiple dimensions to look at an organization in enabling their, um, their engineering and you know, IT spend and IT value or performance. And from a process perspective, the incremental shifts to more modern ways of working, uh, whatever those might be today and whatever they might be in the future, you know, adopting DevSecOps principles across their en enterprise. Security has become a huge uh, and nearly critical uh, part of, of our work to these days. You know, implementing agile and flexible processes with tight guardrails instead of just you know, in relevance to the changes of the organization and tracking performance against using metrics, you know, about flow metrics and the Dora metrics that are helping us understand our processes and our value that we deliver to our customers. You know, architecture, the architects of systems to create speed and uh, deliver nimble, secure, scalable operations, not simply from the organizational perspective, but also a developer level and being enabling developers to be able to work on parts of their code and parts of the system uh, independently and safely to deliver outcomes to our customers. Yeah. And by designing and implementing modern architectures, making applications more modular, modular and scalable, and uplift their application you know, um, availability and security. Yeah. Culture, and as Liz has said, is uh, you know using process to shift culture, but also the shifting culture in its own right, and that is a cultural change over time. And shifting the technology organization and workforces to empower those teams to make decisions on their own um, within the context of what their responsibilities are. And then transitioning to cross-functional along with DevSecOps teams, and adopting a collaborative and continuous learning uh, culture. Because you know, in technology, it is a continuous learning culture. There is no doubt about it. Uh, that's why we're all here today at Happy Days, trying to learn more about what others are doing. And then boosting engineering recruitment using data-led approaches and finding you know, what are the kind of skills that we want to have and how do we maintain a, a, um, a, an ecosystem, a technology ecosystem that is conducive to recruiting. Um, nearly anyone coming out of university these days will want to work on cloud technologies. Um, if you're, most of your technologies are on old mainframes, it's going to be hard to hire grads out of that, uh, out, of the, uh, out of university. And also engineering, uh, codify the, process, the software development cycle by implementing Pipelines as code, um, uh, infrastructure as code, policy as code. So many of these engineering practices are really about making it repeatable and, re and um, repeatable and understandable and safe. Uh, um, and, and, and enabling the basics of engineering to enable the higher value thinking that's important, that we really need to uh, unlock and try to transition to uh, as we transition into a knowledge economy. Well, and we believe that process, architecture, culture, and engineering will help um, organizations keep pace with the ever-changing needs of their competitors, or sorry, ever-changing demands of their customers and technology as we progress on. And I think that's all we have. Indeed, thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Andy and Liz. Um, so tell me, these different dimensions that you talked about in your PACE uh, model there, is, is any one of those dimensions like supreme? Do we, do we, is there one that we should start with first or should we do them all at once? Or what's the kind of optimal mix, do you think? That's a great question, Saul. I'm going to say that none of them is, uh, is going to trump the others, I think. You know, it's it's like the blind men. You need you need everybody contributing, right? Um, because you are taking different perspectives on what it means to incrementally improve your performance over time. We do really advocate, though, for taking a data led approach. So, choosing some metrics which are directly relevant to your customers and to your organization and baselining those, and then tracking your improvement over all four of those dimensions over time. Great. And um, what sort of metrics 
should I be looking at? I mean, the Dora, the Dora metrics are pretty famous. Are they good yeah. metrics? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, we were talking just before about there was a, a talk yesterday about an application of the Dora metrics in an organisation, which is fantastic to see. And we certainly do see the Dora metrics becoming more well known and adopted, which is great. Um, we often find, though, that, you know, just measuring your technology performance is, is only part of the journey. And actually, you should be choosing metrics, which also are relevant for what the business strategy is and what you're trying to achieve. So, for example, if you're... Um, you know, if you're trying to, to increase revenue and the way that you are going after that is to get more features or more products into the hands of your customers much more quickly, then speed is going to be the thing that you should be focused on. And so choosing some metrics aligned to that strategy is going to be important. So, you know, we, we would advocate for a combination really of, of strategic metrics as well as, um, you know, the, the staple Dora metrics, for example. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think the, the Dora metrics are a great indication of that you can move fast, but are you moving fast in the right direction? And that's where right. you need to kind of couple them with, with business metrics as well. Yeah. Okay. And and I guess architecture is um, is a really difficult area <laughs> in my experience because I think a lot of people struggle with their legacy architecture and it's a real journey to move from a legacy architecture to to a more modular architecture. What what do you think are the the ways to approach that? Yeah, great, great points. I'll agree with you completely. And that's why, you know, we're calling out that that's something that's that has been missing for a, a lot of organizations, we'd say, for for a while. But you know, the thing that I touched on briefly there is domain driven design. And we are seeing organizations using the um, the strategies and the tactics which are described in in DDD to great effect to effectively um, either go go bottom up or top down in terms of being able to model what they really have and to use that knowledge to make good decisions about where they need to do things like create APIs, for example, to to start to loosen some of the um, some of the complexity which is inherently in some of these systems. Yeah, I, I think um, DDD, particularly strategic DDD, is a really great way of uh, identifying and understanding the boundaries in your organisation. Yes. Once you know the boundaries, you can line them up and, and kind of have Conway's law um, work for you rather than against you. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I think uh, we're probably at the end of the time. Uh, just one question, Andy, your 3D printing. Um, yes. Does this mean that you are totally uh, self-sufficient now and that you, you, you're in your cabin and you don't need to go outside <laughs> and you've, you've prepared for the apocalypse? Uh, I'm working on it. I'm trying to still figure out how to do metal, but uh, there's something I have to learn in that space. It has to do with <laughs> a lot of heat. I'm not too sure how to do that one yet. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Thanks for your time and thanks for a great presentation. Thanks Thank for having us. Thank you. Okay.